Hello again, welcome back to Asgard, and welcome to the seventh episode of our IC2 Classic Mod Spotlight series. So today we're going to be talking about the remainder of the kind of miscellaneous machines and stuff within IC2 Classic. Um, and first up, we're going to be starting with the sound beacon. Okay, so if I turn this mass fab back on, you notice it's making a little bit of sound, right? Let me turn my, let me actually for this part, let me turn my game sounds up a little bit. My IC2 sounds, you'll notice it has its own sound options. But the sound beacon is basically the muffler within IC2. Okay, so we're going to set a, a, sound mu a sound beacon up here and a creative energy source because this does use a little bit of power. It's only like 5 EU per 5 ticks, I believe. It's a very minute amount of energy. And basically you can see that we have block section, an item section, and an armor section. Okay, now these correspond to different sounds within the game. And for example, um, blocks. If we wanted to mute the sound on the mass fab, that would be blocks. Okay, if we wanted to affect the sound anyway. It's not necessarily a muffler because you can muffle, you can mute, you can increase the, the loudness of it. So, <clears throat> for example, if I put loudness upgrades into this, you notice that the sound from the mass fab bumps up. And I can adjust this sound. And if I wanted to, I could grab some more loud. And one stack is, is the maximum that you can increase it anymore. It's just, you can put more in here, but it's not going to do anything. So we can throw those into there and make stuff louder. Then we can also do items and armor. That affects items and armor within the game. Now, if we wanted to muffle the sound a bit, if we put muffler upgrades in here, you'll notice 64 drops it down to zero. Now let's do a half stack in, or a see actually 21 is the point where sound becomes nothing okay but let's grab say two that's going to drop the sound from 100 percent to 64 percent so you'll notice it kind of muffles the sound down and you can kind of adjust the sound to your liking instead of it being all or nothing or you know you can dampen the sound or increase the sound based on what you want now the mute upgrade just straight it goes from whatever the sound is down to zero so even if I had a bunch of loudness upgrades in there, I threw the mute upgrade, pow, zero. Okay, so if you want to mute a specific sound, you can do that with the mute upgrade. Now there's also these field expansion modules. We'll go over these. There's some other things that you can do with these, um, like the crop harvesters and stuff, but we'll go into these a bit more. But basically the field expansion upgrades work with this as well. So for example, if I came over here and I put down a sound beacon, and I threw loudness upgrades in here. You'll notice it doesn't affect the sound of the mass fab at all. Okay. So if I pull these out, still the same sound. Because the range on this is by default five blocks. Okay, you can see right here the radius is five blocks. So basically it's going to come out five blocks from this. One, two, three, four, five. It's going to come to about this point. Okay. But I can use these field expansion upgrades. And you have basic, you have standard and then you have advanced okay the basic one is going to increase the radius by two the standard one's going to increase the radius by five and then the advanced one's going to increase the radius by ten so for example let's throw a, an advanced field i don't need more than one advanced field expansion you'll notice the radius now jumps up to 15 blocks so it's now covering a 31 by 31 and now we can really hear the mass map right so basically that's how that works, and like I said, you can affect blocks, items, and armor with that. Um, and then you use these three upgrades in combination. Now next up, let's talk about teleporters. This is some fun stuff. And I guess for this, we're actually going to go upstairs. We haven't actually been upstairs yet, so uh, this is what it looks like. I've kind of been showing this as we go, and this is what our upstairs section looks like. Okay. And I think we're going to set up our teleporters up here just for example stuff. So, for example, let's set up a teleporter here. And I know I've got one downstairs. You guys saw it like in the first episode. You were able to see it. But the teleporter does use a little bit of power. Um, so just a heads up. And, well, I say a little bit of power. It can actually use up a lot of power. Depending on how far you're transporting. How far you're teleporting. Um, and if you're doing like cross-dimensional, it's going to consume even more power for having to cross dimensions. Um, but it's not cheap. Well, you'll be able to see a cost here in just a second. So we've got a teleporter here, and then we're going to set up our other teleporter. Well, we'll put it right over here. 
okay? And we're going to give that just a little bit of power. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use this frequency transmitter. And we're just going to shift right click it and you can see link to teleporter. And then we're going to come over here and we're just going to right click teleportation link established. So now these two teleporters are linked. And then what we can do is we can put a pressure plate onto this. And if we were to come over here and basically you have to give this a redstone signal. You can do it with a stone pressure plate. You can also do it with a button. You can do it with a lever, you know, whatever. Um, but if we were to come over here and we stand on this teleporter, pow, it teleports us over. Now, one thing to note is if I was to set another pressure plate here, that would happen. Okay. Now, one thing that's nice, you'll notice that it doesn't teleport me back. And one nice feature about these teleporters is for them to teleport, they have to have had their redstone turned off for at least one second before they can be used to teleport again. So that way you can't get stuck in an endless cycle or have death traps or anything like that um, using the teleporter. So that's why I think a button is better. You know, if you're going to set this up, a button, unless you're just wanting it to be one way, a button would be better because you can actually link those together and teleport back and forth using the teleporter. Otherwise, it's really going to be one directional if you use a pressure plate because otherwise you're going to end up with a cycle, okay? So next up, the teleporter can teleport other things other than just entities and players, okay? This is where it gets really, really interesting. So let's say we have a teleporter right here and we have another teleporter over here and then let's throw down storage block or power storage, power transfer block. And by the way, I forgot to show you, let me see, if we grab ourselves an EU reader and we right click this, you can see that the distance is 13 blocks between these two and it's going to cost 44 EU. And if it's a player, okay, it's 83,644 EU to teleport. But just to give you an idea, let's set another teleporter right here and we'll give it a little bit of power. And we are going to shift right click on that teleporter and we're going to bind it to this one. And by the way, you can just shift right click the air to unlink from the frequency transmitter. But now if we take a look at this teleporter, distance cost is 59 and to teleport a player, it's 112,159 EU to teleport. So basically teleporters are something you're going to have to have a decent amount of EU production in place before you go to actually start trying to teleport, you know. So let's talk about other types of transportation. Let's grab ourselves just a few drawers here. And we're going to put one drawer down on this teleporter, and we're going to put one on this teleporter, okay? Now, you can also do this with chests and stuff, as well as, as fluids and EU. So if you had, instead, you had like a tank here and a tank there, then they could teleport fluids. And if you had, say... Uh, MFE and an MFE, then they could teleport EU over distances. Now, bear in mind that this is still going to require um, power to do that. Now, let's link these two up. So we'll shift right click and we'll right click. Now, if we take a look here, you can see that the distance 13 blocks, distance cost is 44 EU, and it's 100 weight per full stack. Okay. So if I was to grab, say, a stack of spruce wood, and I put it in here, and then let's grab a button, and let's just put it on the side of this, this teleporter here. And so if I right-click this button, pow, that spruce wood is now gone, and it's teleported to this drawer. Okay? And like I said, you can do that with EU, you can do that with items through different things, you can do it with tanks. So if you're like me, I've, I've actually ran into this issue a lot when I use storage drawers where eventually, you know, maybe I want to upgrade it to, um, I don't know, deep storage or something like that. So, for example, let's have a chest here instead, okay? And we'll come back over here. We're going to throw a stack of basic drawers in here. Pow. You can see that it doesn't have to be a drawer, that it can also be a chest or whatever. Now, oh, I put a... Silly me. I was wondering why my items kept sending back. I put a trap chest down. Pro creative mode skills. So every time I went to open the chest, it emitted a redstone signal and sent it back over. So anyways, um, so you can see that it doesn't have to be the same type of item container and same with tanks. It doesn't have to be the same, okay? If you're like me and then, you know, some packs you have, like, say, storage drawers 
and then you decided you wanted to change those storage drawers over to either deep storage or maybe you made some custom drawers with the framing table and you wanted to move all your items over and you don't want to have to pump out, you know, maybe a half a million iron ingots or something like that. So what you can do is you can use this to transfer that. So just a very, very effective way to move items. And I absolutely love it, especially for all these, you know, now that we're getting into things like storage drawers and deep storage that hold massive amounts of, of items. The teleporter being able to do that is, is so good. It's so useful. Now, next up, let's talk about the teleporter hub. Okay. Now, this thing is very expensive. If you notice, energy acceptor limit, 32,768. Okay. Uses up a lot of power. And it requires four teleporters to craft it and a PESU. So this is very, very in-game. Okay, the standard teleporters aren't really all that expensive. The teleporter hub is very expensive. So let's go ahead. I'm going to bump this thing up. I'm just going to give it like 32,000. Okay, now if you hold shift, you can see it's building up. It's charging up power in there. It does have a fairly large buffer. And what you can do is if you open up this, the nice thing about this compared to the standard teleporter is this can teleport to all kinds of places. And instead of needing a redstone signal, you just hit teleport. So for example, let's say, let's grab this teleporter here and we're gonna right click it onto there, teleport target zero. Actually, no, you know what? I didn't unlink it. So I think it's trying to send us, by the way, these ones, if it's transmitting items, it cannot transmit players. So if you right click this, you can see that it's per full, full stack, whereas this one is entity player. That means I can't link this teleporter to this one because these are transmitting items. These are transmitting players. Okay. But so let's go ahead. I'm going to delete that one real quick. And we're going to grab this teleporter and we're going to link it to this hub. So now we have teleporter target one. And if we stand on this, or actually now the thing about it, we don't even have to stand on it. We can just come to it. We can hit teleport and pow. It takes us right over to that teleporter. Now, in addition, you can rename this if you want to. We can say, we're going to call this one three blocks lazy. And we're going to hit enter. And now this teleporter hub is now called three blocks lazy. Okay. So then if we come over here and we set up another teleporter hub, oops. we can actually link these two together. And you can see that we can teleport to three blocks lazy and we can teleport to target three. Okay. Cause we haven't named this one yet. Now, next up, let's talk about luminators and luminator multi-parts. Okay. These are actually really, really, really cool. So for example, let's get ourselves just, I don't know, a couple of different types of glass here just to show you as an example, basically anything that's registered as glass in the ore dictionary will work with these. All right, and luminators are basically what they are, is they are EU-powered lights, okay? And while we're at it, we're actually going to cover a couple small things related to cables that I forgot to mention in the power transfer video, and we're just going to quickly go over those, it's just minor, minor little things that I should bring to your attention. So, for example, if we had, say, a creative energy source here, actually, we'll move it, we'll put it... Uh, like right here, for example, and we had some cables coming up out of this. What we can do is we can attach a luminator onto this, and these are very, very cheap to craft. And you'll notice, I mean, this sticks out. It's its own block space, right? So I can't go up against the wall and then walk into this. Then what we can do is we can take anything that's registered as glass in the ore dictionary. So for example, glass, and we can right click it on there and it takes up the same block space. So this luminator is within that glass block, okay? And it has the same bounding bo box as that glass block now. And so basically we can have a light source. These produce a light source of 15. And they use a very minute amount of power. Okay. They only use 0.25 EU per tick. So basically it's just a really good way to get a good looking light source um, in your world. Okay. We're kind of hidden behind glass and there'll be a 15 light coming out of it. Now, in addition, there are multi-part luminators, okay? And so, for example, if we brought this copper cable out a little bit here, 
which I'm going to bring it to right here. And we put the multi-part illuminator on there. This actually now has the same block space. You'll notice it's flush with the wall. It has it shares the same block space as the cable. So, and you could still do all the same things with it. You can do like, you know, here's glass. Now, if you're using a multi-part illuminator, the glass will be in front of it and will take up the full, you know, glass block space. Whereas with this one, the luminaire goes inside of the glass. So just kind of preference and uh, and whatnot. Now a couple notes. Whenever you put a luminator on to a cable, that spot in the cable can no longer be anchored or sea foamed. Okay? And what that is, we're actually about to talk about that because I forgot to talk about it last time. If you have a cable line, okay, for example that, and you want to put another cable line directly next to this, well, it's going to connect, right? So it makes transferring, you know, different power lines and stuff like that a little bit difficult. What we can do is we can anchor these by attaching a mining pipe to this. Then we can take and run cables up and they will not connect. Okay, so that's basically a way to keep your cables from connecting, kind of like cable anchors in applied energistics or whatnot. And, you know, instead you can use mining pipes um, to kind of anchor those off. Now, in addition, you can also sea foam mining pipes. So, for example, if I had like a line here that runs out, so I had this cable line that kind of comes out. Okay, well, what I can do is I can actually take sea foam and put that on there. You can also use the CF sprayer. We'll get into that next episode when we talk about tools. And we'll also get into the obscurator and stuff next episode as well. That's other features that you can do with construction foam, which we'll get into that. Um, but then we can just right click this with the sand and now we have construction foam walls. And then if we wanted to, you know, we could paint them. So there we go. And you'll notice with the painter, you only paint one side, so you can do that. But if you hold shift with a painter and right click, you're going to paint all sides. I don't know if I mentioned that before, but that is an option that you can do. Okay. And the Obscurator, basically, just to give you a heads up for what's coming next episode, the Obscurator is basically a tool that will allow you to copy any block, you know, the way any block looks onto construction foam. And you can actually do it on a side-by-side -side basis. So it's actually a really nice feature that I plan on personally using just for building. Because instead of having to have, you know, either making multi-part walls where they're half one thing, half another, what you can do is you can do construction foam walls, grab a texture of a block, paint it onto one side, and then in the other room adjacent to it, grab the texture on another block and paint the other side. So then you end up with a one block wall that's still only one block. Okay, and it's actually a cheap way if you wanted to make a, a house out of diamond blocks. Well, you could use construction foam and just make it look like diamond blocks. Okay, and they're a lot, they're really a lot cheaper than even making like in dry facades, for example. It's a lot cheaper. And these can copy, um, we'll get in, well, we'll get into the Obscurator next episode, but there's a lot of neat features about that, um, and we'll talk about those then. Now, lastly, we've got three more uh, machines before we finish out talking about machines. Okay, and first up, I guess I'm going to set it up, we'll set it up right here. So if anybody comes into the base, they're going to be in for a surprise. So <laughs> we have the Tesla coil. Okay, now this block accepts up to 128. So we're going to go ahead and give it full power. And basically you'll notice that this has an internal storage of 50,000 EU. Okay, now what this does is this is going to damage any entities in the area. So let's say, for example, let me grab, we'll grab an Enderman, okay? Enderman have a bit of health. And pow, they're just getting, they're getting killed right off as soon as they spawn. And that's how, that's how the Tesla coil works, right? It, basically everything in the 9x9 nine nine area, it's going to kill. Now, right now I'm pumping a lot of packets into here. So let's drop packets, and we're only going to feed it 128. Okay, so now if I start spawning some Enderman, you notice it kills all of them. But now the power has dropped off. Okay, so now if I spawn some more Endermen, it's just going to damage them. Basically what was happening was it was doing full damage every time. So let's talk about the actual mechanics within the Tesla coil. First up, whenever it kills a mob, one thing you do need to know is it does 
give you player drops. So if you use this to kill, say, Wither Skeletons, you can get Wither Skulls from the Tesla Coil. So it's a very, very nice feature. Um, <clears throat> it affects anything within a 9x9x9, nine by nine by nine, and that includes players, so just bear that in mind. Um, also, you can apply a Redstone Signal to turn it off if you want to. And basically what it's going to do is it's going to build up storage up to its 50,000 EU storage. And then whenever it goes to attack or damage entities in the area, it's going to basically dump all of its power into that attack. Now, all, its, all enemies within the area are going to be hit simultaneously. As you could tell by the Enderman, they were all dying at the same time. And they were all receiving the same amount of damage just for that 50,000 burst of EU. Okay, and the maximum damage that it can deal, so if it's at 50,000 EU storage and it just pew, shoots off all that energy with one single attack, it's going to deal 125 damage to enemies. Massive amount of damage. Okay, and basically there's going to be about a 1.6 second delay between each attack. And it's, it also it only uses up power when it's damaging something. So it's a good way to defend your vice, and it will probably kill anything that gets close to your base. So, just a heads up. I'm actually going to put a lever on this just because I don't want to pop into survival mode and then kill myself. So, but anyways, that's pretty much how the Tesla coil works. Now next up, let's talk about the electric enchanter. Okay, so basically the way this works is if we were to put down some bookshelves, it works just like, in this aspect, it works like a standard enchanting table. So we'll throw down a few bookshelves here. And then we'll put down our electric enchanter. Now, this enchanter, one nice thing about it is it doesn't care if the block between the bookshelves and the enchanter is air or not. So, you know, I could fill this up with, you know, other blocks and it would still be able to find the bookshelves, unlike the vanilla enchanter. Now, we're also going to want to give this some power. You can see that it's an uh, HV machine. So we're going to go ahead and give it 312, I mean 512. And so that's building up on power. You notice it's got a fairly large buffer here. Now, the enchanter itself has two different modes. There's the enchantment table mode and the anvil mode. We're going to start with the enchantment table mode, and we're just going to run through the way this works. So this can be used to add enchantments to either electric tools or standard tools. Now, the electric enchanter is the only way to add enchantments to electric tools. For example, the mining drill, and, uh, and we'll get into that next episode. But let's go ahead and grab just, um, I'll tell you what, we'll get, a, we'll get a mining drill. Or we'll actually get a diamond drill. Okay, so if I put this into here, this slot right here, and then let's get ourselves a bit of lapis. It is going to require lapis, just like the standard enchantment table. <clears throat> this slot right here, of course, is a battery slot. We're not going to use that right now. And right here, what we can do is we can store up experience within this. So we're going to go ahead and just dump all, we're going to fill this thing up with XP, but you can store the XP that you get, you know, kind of like an experience obelisk um, within Ender.io. And then what we need to do is we need to give it some books, and you can use enchanted books if you want. So, for example, let's see, we're doing a drill right now, so let's do, let's do Efficiency 5, Silk Touch, and Unbreaking. Okay, so we're going to put these onto their Unbreaking, Silk Touch, and Efficiency 5. And you'll notice it says 18 levels. Now this is dependent on the amount of lapis that we put in there. So it looks like this one can accept up to two pieces of lapis. And it's going to do a level 18 enchant. Sounds good. And we're going to go ahead and hit Start. Okay, so basically what it's going to do is it's going to use the books that are up here. In addition to the lapis, it's going to enchant this drill. Now, you'll notice it takes a little while to run. And it uses up a bit of power. Now, if you don't have enchanted books, you can use standard just books. But the nice thing about using enchanted books is it's going to apply those enchants as well as additional enchants. And so you can actually end up with more enchants than even vanilla enchanting could give you. Okay. So we'll see once our drill comes out what we end up with. So we have a... Drill here with Wrecking 2, Unbreaking 3, and Efficiency 5. Now, it's actually possible that the Diamond Drill couldn't accept Silk Touch. I'm not 100% sure if that can, but 
So yeah, that's I mean that's pretty much how the the that's the basics of the enchanter. Now we also have this anvil mode, and basically what this is used for is let's get let's get this silk touch book, and let's put our diamond drill in there, and then that silk touch book. And basically what we can do is we can use the anvil to apply books to our tool, just like we could in a standard anvil. Now there are a couple downsides to doing this. The main one being that it adds to the repair counter. Okay, we did put Silk Touch. Silk Touch may have just not been added. It may have replaced it with Breaking 2. Because I know there is a chance to do that um, as well. So it looks like that's what it did was it just replaced it. But it does add to the repair counter. So if you're using a tool and then you have to go repair it, it is going to cost a little bit more than normal for like your initial repair or whatever a repair it is. Because it does add a little bit of cost to that. It also uses up a little bit more XP than doing it within this within the anvil and of course it uses power and stuff as well so but it does have an anvil mode if you want and of course that anvil is not going to break on you that's one major plus side so for example a tool like this that you're not going to repair unless you're just really concerned about the XP that's a good it's a good way to do it you know uh, but for something like a sword or something like that that you may have to repair if you don't have some automatic way to repair it then it becomes a little bit more iffy so now, lastly, we have the Terraformer. Okay, this is a really, really fun block. And I'm actually going to go out here just a little ways before we before we use it. So this area right here, this is a, what is it, Savannah? Yeah, Savannah. Um, say we don't want the Savannah anymore. Okay, what we can do is we can set down the Terraformer. Now, this thing does use a ton of power. Okay, absolute, oops, absolute ton of power. And you'll notice, I mean, there's no GUI for this thing or anything like that. We're going to go ahead and set it up. Whoops. I got a little bit too happy giving it power right there. Okay, so 512. Terraformer will get power now. And I'm going to set the packets up because this thing does use a lot of power. Okay, now with the Terraformer, there's two different types of blueprints that you can use. You have the TFBPs. And then the TFBP biomes, okay? The TFBPs are normal blueprints. And basically, whenever you put these into the Terraformer, they're just going to keep running, okay? Until you stop it, then they're just going to keep running and changing the biome, and they're just going to keep basically expanding out. Or not changing the biome, changing the area, okay? They're just going to keep expanding out and changing the area that they, you know, they reach, into what you specified. Then you also have the biome blueprints. Now these change your current biome to whatever you specified. So basically if I put this if I put this into here, this is a ice plains biome, it will basically go through and change this entire savanna to an ice plains instead. There's also ones for like flattening out the terrain. There's a bunch of different ones, a bunch of different <clears throat> a bunch of different uh, TFB pays you can say like these are all standard you have mushroom islands you have forest it actually removes sand you can make a desert flatten out the area and then you have the biomes you can do plains deserts forest swampland mushroom island jungle and ice plains okay for the actual biomes and then these normal ones are a little bit more specialized um, winter wonderland you're just going to basically make a winter world and that's the one that I have right now. Let me actually go out a little bit farther because spawns like right there, and I don't want to. I don't want to turn everything into like winter world. Okay, so right out here we've got this nice like flat plains area, and we're gonna put down the terraformer. And we're gonna give it a bit of power here, and then we're gonna give it this TFBP chilling. Okay, and we're gonna let that start running. Let me go ahead and turn this up a bit. And we'll go ahead and get a few more of these running. And there you go. You notice there's snow cropping up all over the place. Okay. And I'm actually going to shut these off. I don't want to, like, destroy the, uh, the server with snow. And you'll notice that all throughout here, it's still a plains biome. But basically what it's doing is it's changing this over to snow. Okay, it's basically terraforming it into snow. Now if we set up the terraformer then we'll set it to 512. We're going to say max packets and this time we're going to do the biome chilling. And you'll notice that this is quickly changing this terrain. And if we look right here we are now in an ice plains biome 
This is planes. This is ice planes. So that actually changes the core bio. Whereas the other one just makes like snow and stuff. Okay. So depending on if you want an actual biome change or if you just want like weather and stuff like that change. Um, we'll decide what you what you end up using. Now we'll say the biome one. You notice it's a little bit slower but if we break that off you can see the patches of blue grass. That's ice plains. Okay. And it does do it very randomly. So just be aware of that. You know, you'll, this is like part planes, part ice planes, but it's going to try and change out this entire, like, area here. You can almost kind of see, like, a square effect here. So anyways, that pretty much covers all of the machines, though. Um, of course, if you guys have any questions, as always, do let me know, and I'll do my best to get those answered for you. Next episode, we'll be talking about tools and then upgrades after that, Okay. So I hope you guys are looking forward to it. I know I gave some sneak peeks today for some of the upgrades. And you also got to see a few of the tools and stuff. But we'll cover some of those things in more detail and more thoroughly next episode. Also, there should be a build tutorial video coming out today as well. So stay tuned for that. And I'll be showing you how to get really efficient early game power source set up. Power system um, set up to generate yourself a quite a bit of power. I'm using some of the stuff that we've been talking about, like the crop harvester and stuff. So anyways, I hope you guys found it helpful. If you did, as always, be sure and hit that like button and go ahead and subscribe if you're not already for more daily videos. And I hope to see you guys next time. I feel like we've we've got a bit covered so far, but we still have some really cool stuff. As you guys saw, the cobble gen upgrade is awesome, and there's more. There's more coming, so just stay prepared. Anyways, I hope to see you guys next time. Until then, as always, do take care. Stay safe, and I will see you guys then.